I'm going to talk about transarithmetic and trans science. I use the word trans to mean going beyond. So transarithmetic goes beyond the normal arithmetic and trans science goes beyond the normal science. It goes beyond in the sense of being total. It always works. So transarithmetic always works. It allows division by zero. Ordinary science is guaranteed to fail on division by zero and the infinitely many consequences of that one failure, whereas trans science is not guaranteed to fail, and that's as good as it gets. If you take up trans science, you're not guaranteed to fail. Let's look at some examples of division. 3 by 2 is the number that's 3 divided by 2. Let's be clear what we mean. When we write 3 over 2, what we have written is the number that is 3 divided by 2. And the same with 3 over 1. When we write 3 over 1, what we've written is the number 3 divided by 1. And when we write 3 over 0, what we've written is the number 3 divided by 0. Division by 0 is that easy. It's as easy as writing it down. It's quite hard for people who know how to divide by 0 to understand why anyone would think it's impossible. What do you think is impossible? Do you think it's impossible to write a zero under a line? Or do you have some other notion of what it means to divide? When we write things down in trans mathematics, we use trans syntax. Syntax is just the way you write stuff, but trans syntax is total. It always works. Everything that can be written is meaningful. And dividing by zero is just the act of writing anything over zero. Let's move on from division to cancellation. Transcancellation is exactly the same as cancellation, except that we only cancel positive numbers. Here's an example. We know that 6 over 4 equals 3 over 2, but how do we know? Well, 6 equals 3 times 2, 4 equals 2 times 2. We can split the fraction 3 times 2 over 2 times 2 into two fractions, 3 over 2 times 2 over 2. 2 over 2 is equal to 1. 3 over 2 times 1 equals 3 over 2. And we've proved that 6 over 4 equals 3 over 2. I did that with trans cancellation, but I could just as easily have used ordinary cancellation. And we can do exactly the same with 3 over 0. We know that 3 over 0 equals 1 over 0 because 3 equals 1 times 3, 0 equals 0 times 3. We can split the fraction 1 times 3 over 0 times 3 into two fractions, 1 over 0 times 3 over 3. 3 over 3 is equal to 1. 1 over 0 times 1 equals 1 over 0. And we've proved that 3 over 0 equals 1 over 0. Now, if you found the second example difficult, it means you've misunderstood cancellation. And if you're a teacher, it means you're misteaching cancellation. Now, there are lots of reasons why teachers teach things that are not true. And basically, it's a stepping stone toward teaching something that is true. But where's the harm in teaching cancellation correctly? Here's another example of transcancellation. Minus 3 over 0 equals minus 1 over 0. Now that you've learnt how transcancellation works, you should be able to work through all the details yourself. So using transcancellation, we discover that every positive number divided by 0 is equal to the trans number 1 over 0. Every negative number divided by 0 is equal to the trans number minus 1 over 0. And that leaves the trans number 0 over 0. About 1,500 years ago, or a little more, people in India knew that 0 over 0 is a number. But modern mathematicians have forgotten this. And the question is, why? Why did we forget? And I'll tell you the answer to that at the end of this video. Let's look at what a trans number is. Every fraction of numbers is a trans number. Trans numbers have non-negative denominators. Well, what are we to do if someone gives us a fraction with a negative denominator? If we let d be greater than zero, in other words, minus d is negative, then we can turn the denominator positive 
by subtracting top and bottom, by multiplying top and bottom by minus 1, or just by moving the minus sign. As an overview, it's important to keep track of the fact that every number is a trans number, but some trans numbers are not numbers. For example, all of the trans numbers that involve division by zero are not ordinary numbers. Mathematicians are happy with the idea that 1 over 0 equals infinity. But what of minus 1 over 0? If 1 over 0 and minus 1 over 0 are equal, they're called projective infinities. And if minus 1 over 0 and 1 over 0 are different, they're called affine infinities. But there's a problem with this nomenclature. Both kinds of infinity turn up in projective geometry and neither has the algebraic property of being affine. The terminology is meaningless, and this happens quite often in mathematics. Things that were meaningful change and become meaningless. People who work with trans mathematics say that when these two infinities are equal, they're unsigned infinities, the sign doesn't matter, and if they're unequal, then the sign does matter, they're called signed infinities, and that keeps everything straight. So which do I want? Do I want these infinities to be the same, or do I want them to be different? Well, I just decided I want them to be different, and I did that by defining that 1 over 0 is greater than 0. In other words, 1 over 0 is positive infinity, and minus 1 over 0 is negative infinity. But be very careful. I'm not telling you that infinity is big. I'm only saying that 1 over 0 is positive. It could be very small. It could be very, very close to 0. I'm not saying. It's just positive. So what can we find out about the size of 1 over 0? Well, let's use the standard definition of greater than in mathematics. A number a is greater than a number b when a minus b is greater than 0. For example, 3 is greater than 2 because 3 minus 2 equals 1 and 1 is greater than 0. Conversely, 2 is not greater than 3 because 2 minus 3 equals minus 1 and minus 1 is not greater than 0. So if we take any number x, it's convenient to write it as x over 1, then we can compare 1 over 0 to x over 1. And we do it like this. 1 over 0 minus x over 1 equals 1 times 1 minus 0 times x over 0 times 1. Now 1 times 1 equals 1, 0 times x equals 0, 0 times 1 equals 0, 1 minus 0 equals 1, and so we've proved that 1 over 0 minus x over 1 is greater than 0. And I'm the first mathematician to do this. I'm the first mathematician to prove that infinity is big. All other mathematicians assumed infinity was big and then went on to prove properties of it. And let's be absolutely clear what's going on here. I've proved that 1 over 0 is bigger than every number. So now that we know that 1 over 0 is bigger than every number, it makes perfect sense to call it infinity. We define positive infinity by infinity equals 1 over 0 and define negative infinity by minus infinity equals minus 1 over 0. Here's a cute recursive relationship. I've defined that infinity is greater than 0. It's positive. But that means any number p is positive if p times infinity equals infinity. That's a very neat way of defining what positive numbers are. Usually you have to write down the set of all positive numbers. Ordinary mathematics uses the idea of trichotomy. A number can be less than zero, equal to zero, or greater than zero. There are three possibilities. But transarithmetic uses tetrachotomy. There are four possibilities. So first we define that nullity is the non-finite number zero over zero. Let's be clear. We already know that 0 over 0 is a number, and all I'm doing now is giving it a name. I'm calling it nullity. Every trans number is exactly one of less than 0, equal to 0, greater than 0, or equal to nullity. Therefore, nullity is not any of negative, 0, or positive, which is to say that nullity is unordered. Being unordered is the defining characteristic of the number nullity. Well, let's see how nullity compares in size to other numbers. 
Again, we'll use the standard definition of greater than, a number a is greater than number b, when a minus b is greater than zero. And as before, we let x over 1 be any number. Now you can work out that 0 over 0 minus x over 1 is not greater than 0. In other words, nullity is not bigger than any number. And similarly, nullity is not less than, equal to, or greater than any other trans number. But nullity is equal to itself, which is just to say that nullity is unordered. Now let's look at more of the things you learned in school. Depending on where in the world you were educated, you learn these things in primary or in secondary school. So a over b times c over d equals a times c over b times d. But there's a difference with what you learnt in school. In school, b and d could be positive or negative, but not zero. But now, because we're dealing with trans numbers, b and d can be positive or zero, but not negative. And here's an example. We can work out that 3 times infinity equals infinity. And we do it like this. 3 equals 3 over 1. Infinity equals 1 over 0. We can combine the two fractions 3 over 1 times 1 over 0 into the one fraction 3 times 1 over 1 times 0. That equals 3 over 0. That's equal to 1 over 0. And that's equal to infinity. So we've proved that 3 times infinity equals infinity. I've proved that 3 times infinity equals infinity, but you could have proved it with what you learned in school. You've always been able to divide by 0, it's just that for some reason you didn't. Now let's look at trans division. a over b divided by c over d equals a over b times d over c. This is what you learned in school, but we've got to be careful with the denominators. Here's an example. Infinity divided by minus 3 equals minus infinity. How do we know? Well, infinity equals 1 over 0. Minus 3 equals minus 3 over 1. We can change 1 over 0 divided by minus 3 over 1 into 1 over 0 times 1 over minus 3. We can move the sign from the minus 3 to the minus 1 and multiply out to give 1 over 0 times minus 1 over 3 equals minus 1 over 0, and that's equal to minus infinity. So we've proved that infinity divided by minus 3 equals minus infinity. Now let's look at transaddition. There are two kinds of transaddition. Special transaddition deals with the addition of two infinities. General transaddition deals with the sum of everything else. So infinity plus infinity equals infinity. And we calculate that by using the common denominator, 0. Doing the same calculation with infinity plus minus infinity, we see that the answer is nullity. As an aside, let's ask how big the universe is. Einstein tells us that E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. But we can rewrite that equation as E minus mc squared equals 0. And now all of the energy and mass in the universe is created from 0. It's created from nothing. But all of the solutions to the equation E minus mc squared equals 0 are finite. Therefore, the universe is finitely big. But there's another solution to E equals mc squared, and that is E minus mc squared equals nullity. And remember that infinity minus infinity equals nullity, so we can create a universe with infinite energy and infinite mass from nullity. There is a difference between these two universes. If we live in the finite universe, then the zero we were created from has disappeared. It's gone away. It's not there anymore. It was there before space-time was created, and now it's not. But if we live in an infinite universe created from nullity, then nullity is still there. Nullity is unordered. It doesn't exist before the universe, during the universe, or after, but it is equidistant to every point in space-time. It's at the distance nullity from every point. Now, to push things a little further, some religious people say that God lives at nullity and interacts with space-time from that position. 
if that's true, he lives outside of space-time, he's supernatural, but he can affect any part of space-time. People who like science fiction suppose that we could travel from any part in space-time to nullity back to any other part in space-time, and so we could travel anywhere in space and time. That might be good for a science fiction story. I suspect it'll be rather a long time before we're making these space-time journeys. But there are already machines that operate using nullity, and I'll make videos about some of those another time. General transition goes like this. A over B plus C over D equals A times D plus B times C over B times D. As always, when you learn this in school, B over D could be positive or negative, but not zero. But now they can be positive or zero, but not negative. Trans subtraction looks exactly like you learnt in school. A over B minus C over D equals A over B plus minus C over D. But as always, remember that B and D could be positive or negative in school, but not zero. Now B and D can be positive or zero, but not negative. Transarithmetic is associative and commutative, but it's only partially distributive. So A times B plus C equals AB plus BC when A is not equal to plus and minus infinity, which means that we distribute when A is not equal to plus and minus infinity, but we still distribute when A is equal to plus and minus infinity and A plus B over zero equals nullity, or sine A equals sine B. And notice that A plus B equals zero is not the only solution to A plus B over zero equals nullity. We could have A equals infinity and B equals minus infinity. The trans sign adds one case to the usual sine function. The sine of X equals minus one when X is less than zero, sine of X equals zero when X equals zero, sine of x equals 1 when x is greater than 0, and the new case, sine of x equals nullity when x equals nullity. So now you've learned how to divide by 0, but it would be a good idea to go back over the video and practice each of the steps. At the beginning of the video, I told you that the ancient Indians knew that 0 over 0 is a number, but modern mathematicians have forgotten that. Why did they forget, and who's to blame for the forgetting? Well, it's Richard Dedekind. Richard Dedekind defined arithmetic by taking a line, chopping it up, and saying how to put the pieces together again to make all of the operations of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So he defined arithmetic in terms of cuts, cuts that are now known as Dedekind cuts. But, and this is a critical point, he removed three cuts. By removing those three cuts, he prevented division by zero, and he guaranteed that science would fail on division by zero. When we put those three cuts back, we get transarithmetic. So arithmetic and transarithmetic have an identical theoretical foundation, and you have a choice to make. Do you choose to fail on division by zero, or do you choose to succeed? My conclusion is that using arithmetic is perverse. It guarantees failure on division by zero and in the infinitely many consequences of this one failure. Whereas using transarithmetic is reasonable. It guarantees success on division by zero and in the infinitely many consequences of this one success.